Hey, welcome to Rock, Paper, Hand Grenades. I'm Gary Harper. The I'm running solo so far today again. Uh, I had a guest lined up, and I don't know where they are. But whatever. So anyway, I saw the coolest thing in the news today. I was, dri <laughs> I was driving up to Concord for a, a committee um, a committee assign uh, thing, and uh, I, listened, I was listening to the news, and the greatest thing ever was that uh, Amazon.com, if you ever ordered the, or gone on there to search for things, you pick a product, and they have an algorithm, which is basically a program that that calculates if when people order this, they are also likely to order this, this, and this. So it tries to make suggestions for you so you'll buy more crap from them. Anyway, uh, one of their algorithms, if you ordered um, products to, for cooking, items, the algorithm was showing that other people who ordered that product also ordered and it was a, it was a collection of bomb making material and i just thought that was the funniest thing on the planet that that they would uh, they would be um blindsided by that that was reported in in uh, england i believe that if you go to amazon.com they're gonna uh, you know recommend bomb making equipment to you if you want it i i Personally, I think that's insane because if you were actually going to order bomb making material off of Amazon, you would think you would do it with different accounts so that they can't connect the dots. Not like go to one shop stopping for all your bomb making equipment. But whatever, what do I know? Uh, maybe some of the terrorists are just as dumb as they seem to be. Uh, yeah, I guess really they have to be. I mean, if you're going to kill yourself and to blow other people up. Blowing other people up is an insane thing anyway, but if you're gonna blow yourself up in the process, that's, that's just silly. It's really stupid. Um, and if you believe in a God that says that it's okay to blow yourself up and that you're gonna see virgins, then you might wanna rethink what you believe in. Anyway, so that was, the, that was my humorous part of the day. Um, I also, it's my wife's birthday this Saturday, and I wanted to talk um, about Revelations 12. If you're, if you're on the internet at all, you're going to see people referring to Revelations 12 prophecy, and it's another one of these big hypes. I think some of them, I believe, are doing it legitimately, but I believe most of the, most of the, the, uh, Most of the reports are for clicks. They have false news reports or news reports to get you to click on their website so they can sell advertising. The more clicks they get, the more their advertisers have to pay to uh, post things on their website. And I think that's fundamentally what it's all about. But as a Christian, I wanted to talk about that because it um, diminishes the authority of the Bible as far as I'm concerned. Revelations 12 prophecy, and I don't have my Bible in front of me, but I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. Are you to chapter 12 or verse 12? Chapter 12, Revelations, the book of Revelations. Okay. Um, it re and, and like I said, I don't have my Bible in front of me. If I get this wrong, shoot me. So Revelations 12 talks about a woman who tries to give birth. And as she's trying to get uh, give birth, a dragon comes out of the, comes out down and tries to devour the child. And then the uh, God protects the child for I forget how many days. This is being touted as happening on uh, September 23rd because Virgo, the, the stars associated with the sign Virgo, which is translated as the Virgin, has uh, Saturn is do going retrograde in, in her lower part of her body, which basically for nine months it's been kind of hovering there, and then it's going out of Virgo. And the 12 stars, they claim, I forget what star cluster is above, but that's only nine, so they're adding three planets 
which biblically they used to call stars, planet stars, and so and so, because they didn't know. So that's possible, all right? But I think it's entirely ridiculous. I think it's just like I say, I think it's about getting clicks on your website, because I have always understood, and uh, just a, a disclaimer, I also know that sometimes the Bible means one thing in one era and something else later on also. The two are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but I think in this case it is. Because the the woman trying to give birth, I have always understood that to be Jesus Christ. And the dragon coming out down to try to devour the child, if you know anything about the Bible, as soon as, with uh, a short time after Mary gave birth, the wise men, which I guess weren't so wise, went to King Herod to find out where the king was, king was that they had seen signs of in the stars. And so uh, Herod said, well, if they were born, it would be in Bethlehem. And Herod proceeded to try to kill every child born in that area that was two years or younger. But by that time, uh, uh, Joseph and Mary and uh, the baby had already taken off to Egypt. So that Revelations 12 prophecy, I've always looked at that as the devil coming down and trying to kill Christ before he actually did his ministry. Um, I don't believe that anything's going to happen. I mean, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to believe it right now in that you've had, like, in the last week or so, you've had two major earthquakes one off the shore of Mexico and one onshore. Uh, yesterday, you've had major hurricanes, which happen, but pretty. Uh, we're getting like a, um, especially if you live on Puerto Rico, you're getting nailed twice. Um, there's a lot of things going around, going on in the world. There was, you know, we we uh, complained or were really upset with what happened in Texas, but I believe it was somewhere in India there was thousands and thousands of people had died from a typhoon so it was it was it wasn't really even comparable but that didn't make really make the news so there are a lot of natural disasters it does say that in the end times it will be as a woman in travail it'll be like when a woman just before she gives birth there's more and more birth pains before the return of Christ so some of that is going on but it has been going on um, so I just wanted to say that I think this this if as a Christian it really bothers me when people uh, profit off of um, things like the Revelations twelve prophecy that you hear in the news today because a you shouldn't be profiting from that at all um, and and b what it does and I think this is the actual one of the things Christ said. And he repeated it a bunch of times. He said, in the last days, there will be many people coming claiming that Christ is here, Christ is there. And, and that's what I think this is. It's, it's false prophecies. And what's going to happen over enough false prophecies, enough people saying that Jesus is here and Jesus is there, or he's coming now, or he's coming in two weeks or three months, and, and, and all this other stuff, is over time, people are going to discount and disregard all of prophecy because when real obvious signs do happen, they're going to say, well, we've already heard all that before. What's, what's new? And there are real signs that are coming, are, are just uh, coalescing that are, are huge. Um, my, the biggest one is uh, Revelations 13, that nobody shall be able to buy or sell without the mark of their beast in the right hand or forehead. It has been no time in history that we've been able to require everybody be put on a single monetary system. Um, it is only now in history that we actually have the capability to do that, the, the technology to do it. If you look in... Uh, out west, either Michigan or whatever, a company is just re um, not requiring, I don't think they're required, but most of the people at, at a company voluntarily, voluntarily microchip themselves so they could get in and out of different places in the building and things like that. Um, so that Revelations 13 prophecy 
we're finally at a point in history where we actually have the technology to make that a reality. And so there is, there are very real substantial things that are happening that were written 2,000 years ago. I'll give you another one was, uh, and that might be Daniel, but I'm not, I'm not positive. There was uh, a lot of talk that there's going to be all kinds of um, uh, signs in the heavens. Okay, so picture John, who was a, a disciple of Christ. He's a th really old. <laughs> He's already been tortured, tormented, and everything else, and finally they get sick of, sick of it, and they put him on the Isle of Patmos. And he's seeing a vision, all right? Picture yourself ha coming to life today, or being time traveling from 2,000 years ago to today, and you look up in the sky and you see a, a 727 approaching the airport in, in Manchester you would be blown away. It would just boggle your mind, some of the things that we see in the skies today. Um, I remember right after 9-11, the first thing I saw was an AWACS going over my, my house in Ware, and that was kind of mind-blowing. But, but at any rate, the things that you can see in the sky today, if you were time traveling from 2,000 years ago, it would just freak you out. So... You know, if so, if a, when a prophet looks up and he sees all these weird things in the sky, a simple jet going overhead would would um, fulfill that part of the prophecy because it would just it would it would totally fry their brain. Um, the other uh, one, and that is in the book of Daniel, it says, "Knowledge shall be increased." We're we are we. I heard a really cool quote the other day. It said that um, years ago, scientists, uh, physicists, or whatever, had many theories, but very few, very limited amount of knowledge to try to figure out if they're correct. Currently, at the rate we are increasing our uh, knowledge base, there's far more knowledge than there are theories. There's just our our the amount of human information and knowledge that we have, I, bl I forget what the number is, but it doubles like every few months or every six months or something. It's, it's, it's astronomical how much information we have. Yet, if it's, if it's uh, Daniel, it's probably 2,700 years ago. Uh, Daniel's talking about a time when knowledge shall be increased. And that's hap that is, you can't, I don't, that's not arguable. That is absolutely happening. So there's a lot of things that are in prophecy that are happening, and they're happening right now, um, that are true. So having these these uh, false alarms is is completely unhelpful to uh, to the cause of Christianity. Because to me, the Bible is the truth, and if it's the truth. People who, who, you know, use it for their own ends are, are messing up all the people that, you know, aren't, are, are, might be interested in the Bible, but then they hear, hear something like this and they, it just kind of screws them all up. But seeing that I got all, all kinds of time, I, I think what I'd like to do is talk to you about how I became a Christian. And um, it's not very entertaining, but it means a lot to me. <laughs> okay. So, I was born with a lot of physical problems, and like relentlessly from the day since I was born. I've never, I don't, if, if you're a person that's pretty healthy and you've been healthy most of your life, you really should be super thankful, because I don't know what that's like. I've never known what that's like. Last week, I was supposed to have committee meetings, and this, this stuff just nailed me. I couldn't even get out of bed last Thursday. Um, anyway, so I've had all these physical problems. My dad, who is the one person who that I've looked up, I looked up to all of them as a kid, because you look up to your dad, was, uh, went to MIT, smart, wicked smart guy. He was an agnostic, more of an atheist than agnostic, but kind of an agnostic. 
I then moved on to when I became a teenager, I, I listened to what they said in school. And what they said in school was the book of, uh, uh, I mean, the book, right? They talked about the theory of evolution. And the theory of evolution boiled down means that a parasite or a single-celled animal happened by accident on this planet. That parasite evolved over time, and some of them, those parasites or those single-celled creatures, became human beings. And those human beings, they were teaching this in school, especially now, are actually destroying the planet. So, in effect, what I was taught in school is that you are functionally a fluke of the universe, a parasite on the planet, destroying the host planet that you live on. That's what I was told in school, um, because that's what the theory evolution is. And your only reason for existence is to perpetuate the species, or to maintain it, if nothing else. Well, if you've got a lot of her, uh, her, um, physical problems, heredit her, hereditary physical problems, of all the things you should do, it, one of them is not perpetuating the species because you're a detriment to the species. So that's what I was thinking about when other kids were thinking about what do I, you know, where should I go to college? I was wondering why I wanted to continue because I was physically profoundly uncomfortable all the time. Sometimes it gets really bad, sometimes it's just moderately annoying, but it's, it just fluctuates between those two extremes. And if I am merely a parasite, eliminating this parasite off this planet that's being destroyed anyway is a positive, not a ne negative. It's only for selfish reasons that I would continue. And that's where my mind was at 15 or 16 years old. And... So I started looking because there's the other possibility that there is a God and that God created you. If there is no God, there is no purpose because, again, we go back to the parasite analogy. And so I started looking, and I, I looked in all the wrong places. I was, my mother was Christian, but I refused to, well, part of the reason is I had met kids there were Christians in school, and, and met people in this, in in, um, in town that were Christian, and because I didn't fit in, I was not treated well. So I said, "Well, if they're Christians, I don't think I want to be that, because they're pretty uh, judgmental and, and arrogant." And so I shied away from that, and I uh, I went to. Um, the New Age kind of movement, which isn't new, by the way. New Age movement is as old as, as probably pre, it predates Christianity anyway. So I started into that, and I, I don't believe that that was, I believe that that was the wrong thing to do. However, um, God works through anything. God can help you get through anything, or he can use uh, evil for good or good for evil. And he allowed, through one of the experiences I had in that, which was basically my soul uh, functionally separated from my body, as soon as that happened, and I think God allowed it because he didn't allow me to pursue it after that. So I think God allowed that one experience just to let me know that there is something else out there, that this isn't the end. This is that I, the, the scientific or uh, what they say is the scientific excuse for life is, is not true. Um, and that one experience was so profound and so uh, um, life-changing because then I knew that there was a soul. I knew that the, the body and the, and the soul are two entirely different things. And as I went on, I started studying with different people. I studied with Scientologists. I studied with the New Age people. I studied with whew, the Mormons. 
I'm trying to think of everybody. I, 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 I studied a lot of different things to try to arrive at truth. And one of the groups I did study with also were um, a Christian group that still exists today, or a, a mindset, let's put it that way, of Christians who believe that if you pray hard enough, if you believe strong enough, that God will grant you anything you ask for. And as a, as, as a person who is just looking into a religion, it was very disheartening because I was sick all the time. So if God, A, loved me, and B, would cure me if I believed hard enough, then why wasn't I being healed? Because I definitely believed in him, you know. Um, and it wasn't until later on that I realized that that's heresy also. It is not true. If that was true, Paul wouldn't have died on a cross upside down. Peter, I forget how he died. Uh, John was exiled after being tortured to an isle in Patmos. Most of the disciples you read about in the Bible did not meet nice ends. If God was going to give you everything you wanted, he would be Santa Claus. So God is not Santa Claus. If you remember Jesus Christ, he did heal people, but he did not heal everybody. If you remember, as Paul's going through his ministry, he said he, he had a thorn in his side, and God, he asked God, uh, I think, three times to remove that, that pain, whatever it was. I've always just believed for my own uh, comfort that it's this kind of stuff I have. And, um, and God said, no. No, I'm, I'm not going to heal you. You need that in your life to keep you humble and to realize who is God and who's maintaining you. And so therefore, I will not heal you. I will give you the grace to get through it. So I was studying with these, these Christians and they were completely wrong. They basically built Jesus Christ up to be Santa Claus, and that's not who he is. Because Christ cares a lot more about your soul than he does whether or not you do or do not have a Cadillac. He does not care if you have a Cadillac. He does care that you, you love people around you. He does care that you love God. Those are the things Christ cares about, not not all your... your uh, creature comforts are met. Um, and so anyway, so I, I was studying with them, and that turned me off of Christianity a lot. And, um, oh, the other thing that happened early on is I, ha I had a lot of problems, and I got into recovery. So around 1988, I had been in recovery for a long time, or seven years anyway, and I was at a, uh, um, a church in Nashua, with a friend praying, and the really cool thing, and this is going to sound, sound almost her, uh, heresy, but the cool thing was I was on my knees praying, and I know the presence of uh, the Holy Spirit was in that room then, and it was the moment that I could let go or forgive God because I had this chip on my shoulder from being sick since I was a little kid. I mean, I used to wake up when I was little just freaking screaming because I, because of some of the stuff that was going on with me. You know, it was like te it was, it terrorized me as a child. But it was when I could let go of that anger and that resentment and forgive God that I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And that was the spiritual turning point in my life. And it is absolutely the most awesome thing that ever happened to me. I mean, I've had kids. I've had a lot of cool things happen. That's easily it. And the reason it's it is because over time, over working on myself, and, and or God working on myself is more the more correct way to put it, I was able to kind of let go, let go of a lot of the angers and resentments. I mean, I'm working on that with my grandkids today because of some of the stuff that's already happened to them. And I keep trying to drum into them the idea of forgiveness. 
forgiveness is like the most important thing you can do, one of the most important things you can do in your life. Because so many people, you know, they go through school or they go through an event in their life and they carry that forever. It's like I, I remember I, I told you about my dad. My dad was uh, um, went to was in the uh, in Korea in the Chosan Reservoir and saw a lot of horrible things. His childhood was was not great. His dad died when he was young, and then his mother put sent him off to boarding school because she couldn't handle him apparently. And then he ended up in the Marines and ended up in the uh, frozen Chosen with. Uh, 10,000 Marines surrounded by 100,000 Chinese and North Koreans. And um, he saw some pretty horrible things. And that colored everything after that. That, that those, I think it was like a couple of weeks they were actually in the Frozen Chosen. Those two weeks, let's say, carried on for years and years and years. And the reason things like that can carry on for years and years and years is, A, we don't, we don't ask God for forgiveness for whatever we did during the process. We don't ask God to forgive those people who did whatever problem it was, whatever they did. We don't forgive the people who did it. And by holding on to that anger and that fear and the resentments and the hatred, we just – a a – small window of our life, a small, you know, episode in our life will destroy and take the take the joy out of the rest of it. It's like um and this this is a, a a really good example and it's and think about how hard this is to do. And this never happened to me, but I, I know I've talked to a lot of people who have, but you take a child I, I met a guy. Um who was was sexually abused as a, as a kid, you know? And he's like 50 years old and he's still an, he's he's wrecked. It wrecked him. And the one reason it wrecked him is because instead of looking at look uh, setting back and looking at it like um this thing happened, I need to I need to forgive myself. Maybe my parents for letting me be in that position. I don't know the exact situation or and forgiving the person the perpetrator by holding on to that fear by holding on to that anger that resentment and all those horrible horrible things that that does to a child that event that might have only been for a week or might have been for a month or maybe even just a few hours taints the rest of that life and Part of that is because we don't have forgiveness. We're not taught forgiveness. We're not taught as we go through life to forgive those who have harmed us. I mean, the Lord's Prayer is pretty simple. You know, uh, forgive those who, you know, have trespassed against us. And yet we don't do it, you know. Um, and it, it just colors the rest of our lives and takes all joy away from us, even though it was somebody else who is obviously really screwed up. I mean, anybody that thinks it's a really great idea to do that to a little kid has some serious screws loose. Maybe they, maybe it's, a, it's it, in a lot of cases, people who abuse children were also abused. So that ab abuse from, you know, 40 years ago translated into somebody abusing somebody else 20 years ago. And this guy is, you know, 50 years old and still can't get over it. And it's it's just it it boils down to people can't learn to let go and forgive and, and move on with their lives because whether or not that person's ever prosecuted is not as relevant as the fact that you in your own head because all you have control of in your entire life is you and what's going on in your own head and your connection to God that's all you have control of you have I had, I know that I like I had two guests tonight same guest that I had last week. You'd think I'd learn. I'm not that smart. So um, I could hold a resentment towards them, but it's, what's that going to do? You know, I could uh, uh, be angry about it, but that's not going to do anything. So all I have control of is how I deal with it. And how I'm going to deal with it is just to let it go. You learn from the past. You don't hold on to it. 
And um, that's one of the great things Christianity has got me is forgiveness, to let go and to let God. The other great thing Christianity has given me is once I understood that I was created by God, that means I have a purpose. Maybe my only purpose for the entire 60 years I've been in existence was to talk to somebody out there tonight. Maybe that's it, but that's worth it. God put me on, created me for a purpose. I'm not a parasite, although some people might think so. God created me for a reason, for a purpose. This spirit exists for a reason. It's, it's bound inside this body for the duration of my life, but it's, it's only for the duration of my life, which is very short. In, 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 the, in the respect of eternity, this, you know, whatever, however long I live, 60, 80 years, whatever it is, is a very short period of time. And so God created me for that purpose, for this life. And that in and of itself is one of the most important things I've learned because you can't get that in school. Um, so it's just it's just pretty cool. It's pretty cool to have a program where you can talk to people too. It's pretty awesome. My life is actually, comparatively speaking, physically it always sucks, but it's pretty awesome life so far. Um, there's just been so many cool things I did, have been able to do, and all of that is because God's allowed it to happen, allowed me to do things and help help move me in, in directions. And if you actually stop and listen and pray, and there's just so much you can do and so much you can get out of life. Because getting out of life is, is about doing things for other people, you know. Um, that's the other thing, too, as I've learned over the years. If you're really feeling, you know, self-loathing and sad, uh, the forgiveness part is huge. Uh, loving God is huge. But the real cool thing you can do to get out of yourself is to help somebody else. And if you look at people, if you, if you looked at a scale of who, who is or isn't happy in life, wealth has almost zero to do with it. Um, I mean, if you're completely impoverished and you're, you're struggling just to get food, it would be pretty tough to have to even consider whether or not you're happy. So you don't have a lot of time. But in the United States, almost everybody has food. Um, it might not be the exact food that you want, but you've got food. Most people have shelter. Most people have transportation. Most people, excuse me, most people that want one can have a job. In this life... You, in the United States, you are so blessed. It's amazing. So if you're truly unhappy in your life, you got to reevaluate your life because it's not because you're here. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you just look, it was funny because, you know, um, uh, Trump said something the other day at the uh, UN about, you know, I'll put Ameri always put America first. And people were upset with, oh, oh, this is what they <laughs> – they, he called uh, Kim Jong-un um, – rocket man everybody's really really upset because the president of the united states actually said what most people think <laughs> but anyway um i have totally lost track of where i was going oh life 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 so anyway um i attribute that that change in 1988 to accepting christ as the turning point in my life for my life becoming worth living and at times greatly enjoyable um, at, at, because it's pretty cool um, what I would I do what I, yeah the other thing too is don't take your health for granted I remember I uh, about 10 years ago no 17 years ago I'm losing track of time 17 years ago uh, the, most of my physical problems are related to, like always health food nuts, always tell me, so if you're suffering for this, it's your, your immune system isn't good enough. You need to take more of this and more of that. Well, that's actually not the problem. My problem is my immune system's too good, and it attacks everything. And um, about 
17 years ago, the doctors prescribed for me immune suppressants. And before that, I was on steroids all the time to control issues just so that I could get to work. And steroids are a horrible way to control that stuff because they make you angry uh, and the side effects the long ter of still suffering from the long-term side effects. And um, But these immune suppressants were amazing because they didn't seem – I'm sure they have side effects, but the side effects aren't mood-altering. I don't get angry like I used to under the steroids. Um, I mean, it, it's not a pleasant way to live with gritting your teeth all the time. Um, so I went on immune suppressants, and I went to church uh, back then, I think I, around the t same time. I think Charlie Ford was our uh, pastor at, in Gosstown Congregational, and uh, he's a delightful guy. And I took him aside. It was when I first started on the immune suppressants, and the immune suppressants don't get rid of it. They just moderate it so it's not um, – I don't feel like jumping off a building all the time um, during the summer. So anyway, it moderates it. It takes, it takes the real extremes, typically takes the real extremes out of the picture, which is pretty freaking awesome. And so this, I think, was in the fall. And um, so my after the frost, stuff starts calming down anyway. And then I was on the immune suppressants, and I was had a glimpse of what life like was being healthy, just a glimpse. And I went to Pastor Charlie, and I says, I says, Charlie, why isn't everybody in this congregation wicked happy? He goes, what are you talking about? I says, for the first time in my life, I kind of have an idea what it's like to be healthy, and it's pretty cool. <laughs> but people don't, people don't get it. You know, they, they have their issues that are mostly in their mind that uh, drive them nuts, and they'll continue to allow that to happen. Um, let's see, what else, what other sage advice do I have? Probably not much. Um, oh, cool things that I've done. Cool things that I've done. Oh, yeah, last year at this time, I was going across to California on my motorcycle. I was posting a picture today on Facebook. If you don't want to be friends with me on Facebook, go ahead. That's just Gary Harper. Um, I posted a picture. I was going over the Mississippi on this day last year, which is pretty awesome on the bike. I went over there because my eyes, uh, as people know, my eyes aren't really good. So I, if I was going to do it, I had to do it soon or uh, I wouldn't be able to. And it, that was pretty awesome. It's pretty cool to be able to take a trip all the way across the country on a motorcycle. It was on the bucket list forever. I had a whole bunch of stuff on the bucket uh, Not a bunch, but a few things on the bucket list. One was... Um, skydiving and I went to I think it was New England skydiving or whatever it is over in um, Maine and they were really good there was a pretty cool company but I really hated it I just got really I, I, I get motion sickness easy and that was that was not a pleasant experience I'll never do that again but um, they were good I, I just didn't like it my son was nuts he was screaming all the way down he's had a wicked good time um, and he paid for it so that probably it's good um what other cool stuff have i done oh here's something I, that uh, cool that i did god allowed me to do was sailing back from bermuda on a 27 foot sailboat it was pretty awesome we were going along and 27 foot sailboats pretty tiny and this is one of those epiphanies you have or uh, revelations you have in your life and in the back of my mind I was I don't know early 20s in the back of my mind dad was dad knew everything you know because he was really smart but he had that that dominant um, presence you know what I mean and uh, we're, we're sailing back about I don't know, 200 miles away from Bermuda on our way to Rhode Island, a, uh, you could see off in the distance like a, like a black strip across the horizon. The horizon was just kind of black where the, the ocean and the sky just seemed like black. 
And as it, it got closer, you could see lightning bolts in between, in between the two. And as it got closer, the waves picked up. The waves got to about, I don't know, 20 feet, and the wind was probably about 50 or 60 miles an hour. I'm not really sure. The, um, in, a, in a sailboat, which it doesn't make sense. It's hard, hard to, uh, to uh, vision this, but a sailboat has, with a keel, has a what's called a hull speed. It's the maximum amount that boat can go, and if you put push more energy into it, all it does is start pulling under the boat under the water. So you don't want to go beyond that hull speed because any energy you would in, infuse into the, the situation after that is detrimental. And so my dad had a, a storm jib, which is basically the equivalent of a bikini on the uh, the front of the, the bow of the boat just to try to keep the bow from dipping into the waves. And we had a sea anchor, which is uh, basically a, a cone, big um, canvas cone that you have tied off the back. And what that does is create drag so you're not, not um, going too fast. Even with the, the storm anchor and the storm jib, we were still going as fast as that boat can go. And the waves were uh, white caps, so they were, they were breaking over the stern of the boat. And me and my brother were in the cockpit of the boat. My brother was on the tiller, and I had my back to the cabin. And the waves are just coming on, just filling up the entire back of the boat. And But all inside my head, you know, because, you know, Dad, for a little boy, I don't know if it, what it is like for girls, but for, for boys, even though I was in my 20s, Dad's a tough guy. Dad's been through it. He was in the Marines. He knows it. He's, he's, he's good, you know. So <laughs> So anyway... Um, he, he had a little teeny hatch where he opened up. He opened up a hatch, to ha hatch um, and it was only a, a window about, you know, s six to eight inches square. And uh, he opened up that little hatch to hand out some bread to me and my brother because we've been out there for a while. And um, just as he opened the hatch, one of those waves coming over the stern broke. And he, he opened the hatch and all he could see is water coming towards him. And he... He used some uh, nautical terms and then closed the hatch, at which point I realized that Dad was as scared as I was. <laughs> it's just like there's that part of you that just doesn't want to accept that Dad's human to begin with, much less that he's afraid. <laughs> it was it was quite an, quite an awakening, and um, but obviously we survived. Dad was pretty freaking cool. He was so smart. He used a, uh, a sexton. When, if you don't know what that is, it's basically a device they use used uh, star charts or um, moon uh, uh, phases, maybe of the moon and the stars and the horizon and and things like that. And if you're really good at it, you can determine where you are by your relationship to the horizon and to the stars and he was good enough with it because after this is this is quite a few years ago this is 82 so whatever that is you know uh, almost 30 something years ago the electronics weren't great and knowing dad he's probably cheap too so that all the electronics we had for directional things, all of that was dead by the end of that storm. We had basically a nothing but a direction-finding radio, which is is only really good when you get near the coast, and um, and that that uses uh, buoy signals at certain uh, um, locations where you can adjust to where the signal is the strongest and you know where that buoy what direction that buoy is then you go to another uh, signal and you can triangulate to try to determine where you are um, but anyway so dad with uh, functionally with just the sexton the first thing we saw when we came after we got knocked off of course about 50 miles uh, on our way after that storm and the first thing we saw when 
of of uh, of basically uh, that we were getting near the coast was the uh, the buoy for the end of the Sakonet River or the one of the marking buoys for out a little bit further out, but one of the marking buoys for the uh, beginning of that channel, and it's pretty awesome. He's he's he. I still, you know. Uh, one of the human beings that I have lost over the years that I still really miss is Dad. Um, but that was pretty cool. That was really cool. I'm glad I did it. Really don't really want to go sailing that much after that, though. It was it was a long. It's long to be stuck in a stuck in a uh, for a week basically inside a little cabin and outside the little cabin. Is, I don't know how people do it. It's not. It's not really great. It's not that pleasant, especially when you get hit with storms like that. And that was called a near gale. That wasn't even a hurricane or anything. I can't imagine what that would have happened to that little boat in a hurricane. It probably would have done fine. We probably would have been all messed up, but it would have been fine. Um, so, what else is going on? Oh, yeah. One of the cool things that God's given me over the years, and it's. And it's actually one of the coolest gifts. And if you read any of my posts on Facebook, I have a lot of politically st strong political opinions. But one of the coolest things God's given me is to really care about, to love people. Because you're supposed to love everybody. If you're a Christian and you don't love everybody, you're doing it wrong. That doesn't mean, and, and people conflate loving people with agreeing with them there's not they're two different things entirely um like norm and i are friends and he knows i've never voted for same-sex marriage you know I, I don't know where he stands on that now and and other people that i've known in my life that's my opinion on a political subject and i have a good reason for it um but that doesn't mean i don't i don't love people that want to get married i don't love um I have to love everybody regardless. And but that doesn't mean I agree with them. It's it's more like children. You know, you love your kids, but you don't always agree with them. In fact, there's sometimes you get really angry at them, but you still love them. And um I think people uh mis misunderstand the the idea of love. You know, in the Bible it says you're supposed to love everybody as yourself. And they they think that love means I have to tolerate everything somebody else does, and it really doesn't. It's like Antifa right now. They're they're um, a a group that is engaging in fascist techniques to keep people from speaking their mind. That's all they that's all they do. That's that's their their modus operandi is just to attack anybody that they disagree with. They'll say that they're attacking people because they're, that person is engaging in hate speech. But that's just their opinion. And if and attacking them means you're engaging in hate speech. The very thing that you say you're fighting, those are the tactics you're using. The idea of you know uh, attacking people because they microaggressed you and attacking people because they said something that's hurtful to you and then justifying beating them up for it is far worse than the person who has an opinion that you don't agree with. Because if we can't share our opinions, how, how, can, you, how can we ever as a society get better or, or grow together if we totally shut down anybody that disagrees with us? If you, if you look in England, that's what's going on. I was listening to, I forget what the lady's name is. Um, and England has basically, they don't have a constitution, so there is no guarantee to free speech. And this woman had a, a very, very popular Engl English radio show, and it was she was kicked off because she said, it was right after one of the bombings in England, and she said, we need a final solution. It was early in the morning, she just tweeted it. Well... Upon further reflection, the final solution, I believe, is, is I don't, th I, I, um, based on what she said, she didn't mean it this way, but was taken, deliberately taken to mean the Hitler final solution, which was to kill all the Jews. 
and that she was implying we need to kill all Muslims. That wasn't what she meant, but people took it that way. And because England does not have freedom of speech, she was kicked off the airways. There's people in, in Europe that are being attacked because they have an opinion that people are offended by. And it's Antifa in the United States right now that's trying to do the same thing. They're trying to shut down any opinion that they don't agree with, and they will go to any lengths to do so. And um, this all could be resolved if people just learned to just love each other in spite of our differences. Um, I have one, one of the guys I sit next to in, in the Judiciary Committee in Concord is, is uh, Representative Paul Birch. Paul Birch and I are on opposite uh, ends of the vote almost all the time. And if, unless it's something bipartisan, we never agree on almost anything. But I really care about him. I really love him. I care, I care about him. And it has nothing to do with his political opinion. It has to do with he is created by God for a reason. Because I don't understand the reason does not mean I uh, shouldn't love him. And if we can start doing that, understanding that everybody has a different opinion, they have different, different ideas or where they got their information, if we can't talk to each other out of love and start loving each other in spite of their differences, then, then uh, you know, like it says in the Bible, you know, uh, a... Uh, not a government, I forget what he said, but basically in, in this case it would be a country divided against itself cannot stand, and we can't stand if we can't start learning to love each other. And we'll see you again next week.